Dr. Akino, can you please uh, read this citation for our guests? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Um, now, just before, let me just, um, for our speaker, because I know our speaker, besides being an environmentalist, uh, she's a very strong advocate of um, women in science and engineering and all that. Now, um, I just want to state this um, um, disclaimer before I speak that. Our executive committee is well blended. Okay, we're we're gender neutral. Unfortunately, <laughs> our female um, executives could not attend due to one reason or the other. So our general secretary, assistant general secretary, and so on and so forth are females. So because I know just before you start picking on us <laughs> on that, I'm just throwing it in there. So yeah, they 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 were indisposed. So um, thank you very much, and let me just go straight to um telling us a little bit about the um, the speaker. So um, Cecilia Medukmi is a senior lecturer in uh, the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences within the School of Natural Sciences and is also the coordinator of the Student Ambassador Program at the University of Manchester. Uh, she completed a BSc degree in biochemistry at Bayero University, Kano and then worked for a Nigerian soft drinks company as a process control officer. Uh, following her master's degree in pollution and environmental control at the University of Manchester, Cecilia worked as an environmental auditor for a UK rubber recycling company. She's also been an environmental officer with the UK Environmental Environment Agency and Environmental Compliance Advisor with Sellafield Limited which I believe is a nuclear site, uh, formerly known as BNFL in Cumbria. Upon returning to Nigeria, she worked at the National Open University as a lecturer, as well as course coordinator. Um, during this time, Cecilia also studied for a PhD at the University of Manchester, where she examined the impact of point source pollution on an urban river. Um, during her PhD program, Cecilia was nominated for the Volunteer of the Year Award in 2015 and Volunt Hero in 2016 by the university for her role in public en engagement involving citizen science activities related to aquatic ecology. Um, Cecilia is passionate about citizen science as a way of engaging with school students as well as women and minority communities. Uh, she's passionate about the involvement of research in knowledge exchange and public engagement. She has contributed to Blast Fest Science Project, uh, Manchester Science Pro Festival. Member, she's a member of Equality and Diversity Working Group and in partnership with organizations such as the British Ecological Society. Uh, CWEM, and she is the convener of women in environmental sciences. She's also a co-lead with the National Community for Engaging Environments. Okay, so um, so that's just a little bit about our speaker for tonight. And um, having said that, uh, may I please invite um, Cecilia, to please um, carry on with today's uh, technical session, please. So um, the time allotted for this presentation is 40 minutes maximum time um, with 10 to 15 minutes available for question, answers, and interaction after the presentation before we now move on to the um, general meeting. So yes, please be my guest. And um, if there's anything you want me to help you with with regards to making your slides visible. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I hope you are well. I'm very pleased to be invited. And um, thank you. When we had the discussions with the Manchester branch of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, they told me I could carry on with the topic I had um, put forward to them. Because they had told me the topic that this is the beginning of another series. And since it is the beginning of another series, I think it means we have to set a standard about what it is. 
And so that's why the theme came, or the topic came, protecting our collective property. So before I start telling you what it is, I would like to just give us a structure of what we're going to do today. I'm going to give a definition of what it means for collective property, and then we'll look at the challenges and effects, management, looking at UK, looking at Nigeria, and then examples of what we should do. And then I will summarize and conclude. So hopefully we would all have something to take home. And um, maybe there will also be a few things I can learn by virtue of your listening. So I hope you enjoy. <laughs> So when we talk about collective property, what is our collective property? You know, collective property has to do with something that belongs to all of us. You know, it's a property, something we have to protect and that could be our air, the land, our water, it could be our animals, our biodiversity. When we talk about collective property, we are looking at if there is a collective property, it means that there is a collective responsibility. But the theme actually came from the report from the World um, Commission on Environment and Development some years ago, which is our common future. The report was on our, our common future. So that is looking at how we can sustain our environment for future generations without impeding the conditions where we are now. That is the definition of um, sustainable development that I actually flip back. It says the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the future generations from meeting their own needs. So in other words, that collective, that common future we are talking about is flipped back and represented to us today as our collective property. So when we talk about our collective property, we are also looking at how we can um, protect our ecosystems so that you know, the systems, the ecosystems that belong to us, how we can protect it. In other words, to protect it, it calls for collective responsibility. How can we balance our environment? How can we balance inputs and outputs? Because, uh, because we are engineers, I'm going to be mixing a few things so that it gives us something to think about in view of what we do. So our collective property is how can we preserve the balance of the environment? How can we preserve the inputs? How can we preserve the output in view of what we have? How can we control the order? So it is also about human prosperity because by the time you protect your collective property, it means you are preserving the systems for everybody. And then we can all collectively enjoy. So please, put this in mind, collective property, collective responsibility and balance. That's what is going to form the basis of what we are discussing today. So when we are looking at um, the different aspects of the ecosystems, you know, I mentioned the land, the air and the water. My own interest is um, the fresh water. The fresh water ecosystem is of interest to me because it is a scarce resource. That is number one. I'm an ecologist and the aspect that interests me is how we can actually understand the synergy between the biodiversity within the ecosystems and the physical as well as the chemical compositions in that place. Well, why is fresh water important? We have less than 0.001% of fresh water available for us. And this minute um, water is already going to be a problem globally. It's already a problem, it's a, it's a source of conflict in many parts of the world. And where we come from as Nigerians, I'm sure this is no news to you. So let's see why is it even more um, apparent that this is a problem. If you look at um, this um, report that was produced by the World, World Water Development Report some years ago, it says globally, the fresh water available for domestic use is 70%. And then 22% is for industrial activities. And then 8% is for domestic use. Now let's go to high income countries. Out of that 0.01% um, I told us about, 59% is used for industrial activities in high income countries, and then 30% for agricultural, and then 11% for domestic. Now in low and medium income countries, of which where we come from, Nigeria, or some you know, African countries, 82% of what is available is used for agricultural activities, 10% for industrial use and 8% for domestic use already. Even just by virtue of these statistics, it shows that there is a problem. There is a collective problem because 
even a circumstance whereby we have 8% for domestic use, which means there is already a challenge to our health and sanitation because there is not enough water available. And then we have 10% for industrial use, which means the industries that are sited near water bodies, not all of them will be able to undergo dilution so that we are also having going to have natural already set up challenges for pollution. Amongst other things, we are increasing in urbanization. There are slums that are growing up every time. Some houses are built on floodplains. There are no direct, um, you can't see where the pipes, the sewage pipes are connecting to treatment works or they don't even have sewage treatment works. So these are some of the challenges that are going to be issues or already are issues competing for the scarce resource that is within us, our co collective property. So now we are going to talk about the challenges and the effects. Some of these challenges you are already aware. Some of the challenges you know, that affect the balance of our freshwater ecosystems are things we already know as engineers and as people who live and work in the environment. We have the combined sewer overflow. The combined sewer overflows, I'm sure majority of us know, is supposed to serve as a storage so that should there be some form of um, storm, it can be stored for a while and then released by the water companies or the people who manage the infrastructure at a conducive time so that the level of dilution is higher at the time. But there are circumstances where these combined sewer overflows are becoming much of a challenge. First and foremost, maybe it's because of the lack of maintenance to in the infrastructure or lack of control of the valves so that instead of them being intermittent um, effluent that are discharged intermittently, they should be dis discharged intermittently. Sometimes they are just released arbitrarily. So that in some places you just see raw sewage on, on, on our rivers here in Europe. And then we also have the challenge of the wastewater treatment works, which in some cases will treat significant to a significant extent, but not completely. So that some of the, if you measure some of the waters from our rivers, you still be having high concentration of certain nutrients or high concentrations of organic materials. Not to talk of this could be a problem in countries whereby we don't even have sufficient wastewater treatment works due to the increased capacity of human beings. And then other challenges we are looking at that radically disrupts the number of biodiversity is the canalized rivers. You see this place looks very, you know, looks very well um, concreted. This one, a system that is concreted like this does not mean you are going to really have a lot of um, organisms in them. And yet, these organisms are part of the systems that are necessary for our environment, for, our, for the sustenance and maintenance of our collective property. We have challenges of urban runoff from, from the roads, they drain into this place, and then the oils, the chemicals, and they just wash directly into our rivers. Okay, we also have illegal dumping of waste and then other chemicals coming out of industries. Some of these may be treated, some of these may be discharged raw. So in terms of managing our rivers, I said earlier that my own interest is ecology. In ecology, we are looking at the interactions between the biology, the biology, the, bio, the biota with the physical and chemical environment. So because in most cases, I am aware that some of our environmental engineers will be looking at the physical, the chemical composition of water. These are subject, you know, if we look at that aspect, only that aspect, there is a tendency that if the rate of flow within the river is high, there will be dilution over a certain extent, okay? The load of the nutrients, the load of the contaminants will be diluted given a certain period. But if you measure the biological components such as the macroinvertebrates, as you see here, these ones are there and you, it can actually give you the status of the system either for pollution or other stress conditions. So for example, you see some of these organisms I have um, taken here. These ones, you can find them in systems that are clean in places where the water flow is very high and the level of oxygenation is high. In other words, just like we breathe in oxygen and um, you know, for, we need oxygen for survival, these kind of organisms need oxygen for survival. Lack of oxygen will kill them. In this kind of one, you will find them in systems that are not so clean and not so bad. So these are just examples. And this is me here looking to show how you have to dig, um, collect some of these organisms. 
I mentioned the fact that um, the physical environment as well as the chemical is important for, for my own kind of study, ecology, looking at the ecological interactions. You can see that here, you know, is the edge of the river. So here, the level of erosion into this place can also be another important um, aspect when we are looking at the impact on the biota, the amount of sand, the seals, the amount of stones, you know, and the level of flow are some of the factors that are considered when you're looking to assess a system, either for pollution or other stresses. So these are other organisms, you know, look at this dragonfly. And when I'm actually showing you this one is also the fact that you kind of have an, have an appreciation of what is available, have an appreciation of what is there that, you know, are there really this kind of organisms in our water bodies? So the abundance, the diversity of these organisms are important for the ecological functioning of our systems, ecological functioning of our rivers. So bring it into context. Some of the things I've just described to you, I will just use this to summarize. Look at this is the trophic level. This is the nutrient level, the state, the levels at which each organism occupies in the food chain. This one where I said the pelagic pathway by your left, this one is the open water body, while this one is at the, at the base where the sand is, the stones, the silt, the mud. So in summary, I won't, without going into too much um, ecological details, I will just break it simple. If we remove this tree and then fill this place with um, maybe buildings, what would happen is that we would impact on the abundance and the distribution of this organism. So this web that has been generally created, including the fact that the, you know, what is here will be fed by this um, freshwater stream. And then this freshwater stream will, feed, will be fed by this, fee, uh, by this fish. So this fish is growing fat and, and nice. There is a continuous circulation. If you build, if you remove this tree, which some of the organisms feed on, and then also pass out their feces. The nutrient circulation in this system will be destroyed. That is number one. Number two, if this place is polluted, let's say we mount an industry somewhere here and they don't control their effluent, this is going to disrupt the system. Okay, that is number two. Number three, let's go upwards. You can see some of the, you know, the farther we go up, we see that we have um, the different kind of fish, here, including our catfish, which will fall under this category. If we over abstract the organisms here, if we over abstract the fish here in the course of, okay, this is what we do for a living and we enjoy eating fish, we enjoy eating catfish pepper soup too much. What is going to happen is that you will also destroy the system. So over abstraction, nutrient pollution and um, sewage pollution and then urbanization also, they don't help a system to grow properly. They actually disrupt the system. And the economic implication of this is that if we destroy the system, apart from the fact that this place will be looking very ugly to see, it will be smelly and stinky. Another thing is the fact that the people who make their living from fish, you know, as fishmongers, will not make their money. That's number two, we deprive them of their jobs. And number three, we too, that we like eating pepper soup, catfish, or different kind of fish, we would have a problem because we are not certain what we are eating. So what I'm basically, the take home message here is that we need to maintain a balance. We need to maintain a balance. We need to be able to preserve the balance in our environment. That is, and our biodiversity is very important because we as human beings, we start at the top edge the ecosystem. So just to bring it into context, this is um, what I usually show my students to give them a kind of first hand understanding. Look at here, if you look at this pillar A, B, C, and D, just to give us heads up understanding. You know, I said, just like um, we human beings, we need oxygen for our survival. Organisms also need oxygen for their survival biodiversity, they need oxygen for their survival. Our fish and all the others that maintain the circulation of the system need oxygen. In fact, with the presence of oxygen, if there is ammonia, it will be converted into a usable form of um, nitrogen component 
or organisms to feed, to use. So now imagine here, there is a pollution. Immediately there is pollution. There is a depression in the oxygen. As you can see, it just went down. There is a depression in the oxygen and immediately there is a low, there is low oxygen. The ammonia level increases automatically. And as this is happening, all the fungus, all different kind of disgusting, it's not appealing to the eye, will start coming up. And then the next thing you start seeing the growth of other organisms like these are worms, the tubifidae, they are worms. And these ones, because they are very comfortable in low oxygen conditions with high organic matter conditions, what happens is that they start reproducing almost immediately. So look at, if you look at this place, you say, I said it's distance downstream, which means if we have sufficient flow, if the level of flow of water of our river is higher, let's say is moving from upstream to downstream, it means the dilution of the sewage will be faster. And when that happens, it means that maybe in a few hours, in a few days, there is a possibility that we will go back to how our water system should be. But in a circumstance whereby we have filled this place with illegal dumping of waste, we have filled it with a lot increasing pollution, then we collapse the system. We collapse the system. And there is no balance in that case. So in the UK, there are different ways they manage the water, the through the monitoring and assessment protocols, and then we have everybody is aware with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 6, which looks at the health and um, the water sanitation. And then Goal 14 looks at water, life below water, like the organisms I showed us. And then there is an effective compliance to national standards. So industries are regulated and the different degrees of regulation varies between locations. And then we also involve the members of the public to partake in protecting their water bodies. There are partnership groups within the UK. And these partnership groups include people from the academics, from academia, people from industry, local people, personal individuals, you know, non-governmental organizations. In fact, people who have a general interest in their river catchment. So that's the way the system is maintained. So the responsibility is not for one person alone. The responsibility is quite um, widespread with the environment agency still being the regulators. So we now come to here where I bring back what I have said initially concerning protecting our collective property and the need to ensure collective protection in view of collective responsibility. Now with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which came many years after the World Commission on Environment and Development, the Sustainable Development Goals built on the Millennium Development Goals. Because with this Sustainable Development Goal, the aim is that it should go beyond actually touching lives. If you look at many times when people are speaking, if you, they just put in, everybody wants to speak, they're just flashing, um, sustainable development goals, you know, how do we contain, how do we address sustainable development goals? But the basic thing is that in view of what we are saying, looking at our discussions in terms of protecting our collective property is to have an understanding that the small, small things we do in order to protect this, our environment is actually adding up. And what the UN United Nations came up was that if we are going to consider the concept of sustainable development goals, we have to look at it in view of leaving no one behind. Leaving no one behind. Because the planet belongs to all of us. You know, the changes, the increasing temperature. For some of us who live in different parts of the world, even in Nigeria, you see that there are areas with higher temperature. There are areas in the, in the northern part, the temperature is quite high in some times, and then it could be freezing cold at another time. You know, and then the degree of humidity and precipitation, which is also affecting agriculture in different kinds of ways and people. And then we have our people, you know, we need, there are people who are suffering more than others, who are facing the challenges of drought, challenges of erosion, better than other people. Because the vulnerable people who, or people who have no money, the poorer areas will suffer more. And then, of course, with poverty, it also adds its own extra. And then we look at when we are talking about the prosperity, if we are going to you know, protect our environment collectively, then it means 
we have to look at ways of balancing the people who have plus minus the people who do not have, which is a bit difficult. But it's about when we say collective property is ourselves looking at how we can, in such a ways, through personal responsibility, add to how we can actually manage these things. In other words, to reduce inequality, which is one of the goals here, goal 10. And then, of course, we talk about peace. All of us know that before we do anything, we need peace to be able to achieve sustainable development. And then with the partnerships, you know, if we're going to effectively protect our environment, we need partnership. We need strengthened partnership. And I'll mention that in a few minutes. And then, of course, to involve people either through the science of our work or through engagement. So I have given us the context of what happened in the UK or what is done in the UK and then globally what is the expectations globally. Now let's come home because this, we said, is a Nigerian society of engineers and this is us. So giving us an understanding of what it is that um, we can do to help balance our environment, to, have, to help keep the balance and potentially maybe to start helping us to think of what we can do and do together. Now. I was uh, in, in preparing for in preparing for this talk. I just decided to see maybe there are there are research articles I could leverage on just to see just to give us something of reference. And then I stumbled on this paper, which was written by Kayode Etal. I want to believe that she was with, working with Nezria before she went abroad to do some studies. And it was through her paper, you know, she kind of just hit on the points that were issues, you know, in Nigeria in terms of managing environmental um, aspects, managing the, our collective responsibility. We all know that the population is rising. This one we have no control over. You know, we have over 200 million people in Nigeria. Urbanization, we have 50, more than 50% urbanization taking place in Nigeria. And that means because of the increasing human population, there is also an overload on the infrastructure of the wastewater treatment work, that is if we have it in the parts of Nigeria. And uh, if that is the case, if we have an overload on infrastructure, in other words, the numbers of people that are using the treatment works or wastewater treatment plants are more than what the infrastructure can carry, it means undoubtedly we are going to have the issues of discharges, if, 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 no, I beg your pardon, the issues that the water may not be effectively treated, that's number one. And then we might also be having indiscriminate discharges, maybe from sewage pipe, bust sewage pipes or misconnections like that. So some of these issues, and then the fact that areas that are rivers may have been blocked by illegal dumping of waste because there is no flow. So all these kind of things will also backflow into people's houses when there are when we have storm, you know, when we have floods. Another area where she actually mentioned, which also I am aware, is the theoretical and weak legal framework, weak compliance or non-motivation on the part of those who need to comply, and then the lack of a weak baseline test. Honestly, if we are to look at these kind of issues critically, I'm sure maybe this is what we already know. The theoretical or weak legal framework, you will see that I have. <laughs> I have worked in uh, I have worked in industry in Nigeria, and I know what it is when different regulators will bring you different kind of things to comply with, and they give it to you theoretically. You look at it, uh, how do you comply with this? And then this one brings about the something. How do you comply with it, I irrespective of maybe it will cost the company a lot of money? Look, if we are going to, so these are some of the challenges that it helps us to start thinking how can we strategically maybe streamline systems to start working in our favor. These are some of the issues. And then, so because the Cecilia, I think you just muted yourself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we are, we can too. Okay. So we were talking about the theoretical and weak legal framework that we need to go beyond theory and maybe go beyond the presentation of theories to those who need to comply to issues and start facing how we can practically you know, implement issues in our businesses, issues where we are. And then weak compliance. So if the, everything is based, is very theoretical, then there will be no motivation on the part of the businesses to apply. 
Some of us here may be consultants for companies, maybe consultants, or even maybe regulators too. How can we help those who are doing work to actually comply? So those are some of the issues we have. And then we have the lack of a weak baseline test. Honestly, some years ago, I went to uh, a water resources management, um, you know, it's part of the government. I refused to mention the location. And I went to get, if see the possibility of getting some data of them, just to give me heads up information that I could use for later. I went, I went, I went, the protocol was too much. But nevertheless, I persevered and I, by the time I got the data, they told me I shouldn't announce it. I should not mention the person who gave it to me and it is not allowed. Okay, no problem. But when I asked, saw the data, when I started looking at the data properly, I now saw that there was no connection between what we have as a result and the standards that were used to measure what had been provided. And I wondered, which standard are you using? It is not Nigeria, it is not Africa, it was from somewhere, you know, maybe from the World Health Organization or somewhere, somewhere. But how can you compare a system that has been developed somewhere to use it to assess our own system? I think, I'm not sure if we will match up properly. But, you know, this first, that kind of information is misleading because is because it's not readily available, we can't really do anything about it. That is number one. Number two is actually not a truthful representation of what we are and where we are looking to, where we are looking to go. If we are really need, if we really mean to do something. And then we have a lot of researchers because I checked online. We have a lot of researchers carrying out studies in view of water quality, water management, and measuring physical chemical variables. Some of the data they have, you know. There is a disconnection between what they have with the practitioners. So just to give us heads up on some things, can I be okay? On some of the things I have been mentioning. You see this picture? This is not new to some of us. This may not be new information to some of us, especially those that live in Lagos. And then you can see the one below where the where the woman is washing her plate on the water. There is something I just want to show us. This is somewhere in Lagos and you see people living here. You know, this is the house of some people. And then this woman gently washing her plate, you know, and then you can see this one by the left. You can see these are houses. You know? And then God knows how long these had been accumulated, the waste had been accumulated here. And then you see children going around, even the goat is going to serve as uh, a celebration um, animal, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. Honestly, these issues here, you can see is not appealing to the eye, number one, the aesthetics is not beautiful, is not appealing. Health-wise, there's going to be issue. Maybe these people here are suffering from diarrhea, cholera, we don't know. Even the quality of life here is not so sound. The flow is reduced. You just see that aesthetically there is nothing appealing. Same thing. So I want to read just certain things for us. You know, our president, you know, in providing some information to international bodies said, in Nigeria, please listen carefully. In Nigeria, 123 million people are without basic household toilet. 60 million people are without clean water close to home. In other words, they have to travel miles to get water and those who can afford it will pay for it or even have tanks in their homes or wells or bottles. 166 million people do not have a way to wash hands with soap. 50% of schools are without basic toilets. In other words, some of our children do not know how to use proper toilets. So uh, the hygiene of the children are already compromised. And then 30% of healthcare facilities do not have a water source on site. So progress on sanitation is regressing. For every human, for every urban resident reached with a decent household toilet, another two will join the queue to wait. These are just for us to think. I'm sure this is something we know, but these are facts that our president, the president of our country had um, brought out in order to be able to 
provide information on how what we can do, especially with increasing rate of urbanization and um, a need for us to be able to have some indices for measure. So what can we do? Nigeria. Honestly, the first and foremost thing we need to do is that we need to have a transformed mind. We need, that's why I put this picture here. It says we should be transformed by the renewal of our mind, you know, beyond our high opportunity. We are opportune actually to be able to have degree, to be able to have, to have jobs or even to work, to be able to think the way we are thinking, listening to talks like this. We need a transformation of the mind that is beyond our work, beyond our professionalism, beyond everything we do. How can we have a personal versus collective responsibility to protect our collective property? It might just start be, maybe we should start clearly looking at maybe the reasons for monitoring uh, work, you know, carrying out effective operational activities, collecting data, because if we have data that we collect as part of what we do in our country, then maybe it is an opportunity that we can start forecasting things for the future. It might be an opportunity for us to start thinking how to do things, maybe start you know, looking at ways we can actually use our engineering solutions to solve. And then we can start develop looking at, could we develop our own baseline tests and environmental standards? Some years ago, we were discussing with this aspect with the National Open University to see, maybe we can start looking at, you know, liaising with some people so that we can actually have something that is ours. Can we start looking at how to make our regulations, you know, easier for us to understand and actually to help compliance, you know, beyond just, okay, looking for balancing or negotiating some things that are not real. Maybe we start looking at small, small ways of how we can actually do things. Maybe we also need to train staff. The lady whom I told, you know, the person who wrote the paper I had shown you earlier, Kaya Rieta, said some of the staff in some of the environmental institutions do not really have information on what they really do on a daily basis. And then here we have some of us, we are engineers. Maybe we have to start looking at what, how, you know, maintenance of infrastructure, what are the operations, what are the, the structures in place for maintenance of things, just not beyond routine. And then maybe we start educating more people, creating some kind of awareness. And then maybe having some collaboration with people who work in the health industry, the medical doctors, all those researchers, so that maybe diseases can be reduced and then we can also help to build the aesthetics of the environment. We may not be able to do things too much, but at least maybe we can contribute or support with other groups so that even our environment, small, small, we can start um, doing something good. And then let's start saying how we can carry out research with impact. And then maybe consider the implications for our rich biodiversity. Honestly, Nigeria is rich but in terms of biodiversity. So why am I saying this? This is a common collective property. Let's start from where we are. What can you do? So we were talking about collaborative working. Yes, maybe we can start looking at the engineers, working with ecologists, working with other communities to be able to help, you know, to, to keep our systems clean for everybody, you know? And then we need to start looking at understanding the key roles of institutions. Some of us work in, in water resource company, Ministry of Environment. Some of us work with um, international standard organizations. Let's see how we can reduce confusion for, in the, for industries and those who help them to comply, their consultants, who could be also some of us. And then maybe we start looking at how we can engage other people and then streamline our communication, make our communication easy for people to understand. Because, you know, sometimes we use, um, you know, we are very technical people and then we use technical terms that maybe even the local people cannot understand. And why is it important for us to talk like this? Because if the environment is our collective property, plus the rich, plus the poor, plus the vulnerable, plus the healthy, everybody, the illiterate, all of us, we are in this together. And so we have to look at how we can use our high-ended, you know, we can bridge the gap between what we have and the people who have not, and then maybe that is when we start actually acting collectively. This is an example of partnerships. You know, this one I'm aware of, of uh, a river that had, this river Medlock is one of the five um, tributaries to a major river in Manchester. It used to be very polluted many years ago, very polluted. But, um, and so there were floods in many, you know, more than 100 years ago. So what happened basically was that they now built um, bricks, 
you know, they now put red bricks on the on the river so that it will enhance flow. In that, in their thinking that time was that by the time they put the red brick, it will enhance uh, flow in, during the flood. And um, eventually, maybe through understanding of um, the flow of water, flood management, they now saw that while this is happening, number one, it is not helping to reduce the flood flow. It is not helping to reduce the flood. But at the same time, there is no biodiversity richness. It has been lost over many years. And they decided to carry out, you know, to remove the red bricks and then start seeing what could happen. Honestly, within the three months where they had removed the red bricks and started doing some major construction over a 300 meter stretch of river, we started seeing organisms there, all the organisms I showed us before. And then not long after they saw a kingfisher bird, immediately you see the kingfisher bird, it tells you, oh, there is some fish here, I have some food here. And then it means there are some other small, small biodiversity there. The richness of that diversity was actually what started bringing some kind of hope that, wow, we can use this location as a, as a, as a, as a case study for other areas. Yes, this place is in East Manchester. For those who live in Manchester, it's around from Oldham coming towards Manchester city center. So, and after that, you know, later on, everything was developing. That form of restoration was what they invested in. There were engineers who worked on this project as well in terms of assessing the stretch of the river and then the weirs that were there. So there were a lot of engineering works in Nadish. So there were a lot of collaborations between the people who worked with the Environment Agency, which is the, you know, our own Ministry of Environment here, and then other community groups. The community groups played a significant role in the funding they received. So now we are getting close to finishing. What should we do? I'm just going to give us an example and maybe it may start um, helping us to see what we can do from where we are. Maybe the children we have, we can start, you know, some of us have children, some of us have nieces and nephews, you know, grandchildren. Maybe we can start, you know, helping them to be able to, to see things differently. You know, we mentioned that 50% of schools are without basic toilets. Maybe it could be an opportunity for us to start seeing how we can use our systems to, to start developing children, small, 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 small things to start helping them to see what their roles could be. And then we can start involving communities. Communities is very important. This place is in um, Manchester. For those who are in Manchester, this is more side. More side in Manchester is regarded as one of the deprived areas of the city. So people kind of are careful of these places, the people that sometimes, you know, different kind of issues you find here. But when you go to a place like this, you have an opportunity, we were invited, we went, you will hear very strange things, things you may not necessarily have connection with because, because you are kind of you have your education. There are people who have a different kind of thinking, different kind of mentality. But you go there, and then maybe you, it's an opportunity to engage. An opportunity not only to engage from your professional perspective, maybe opportunity to change the lives and the minds of some of the children, their families, their parents, so that they start doing things or thinking things in the right way. And all these ones I'm talking about is, you know, everything is linked to the different sustainable development goals of education, of um, reduced inequality, and then of partnerships. And then here for the elderly people, you know, where we come from, we have some of our elderly people. There are some people that are retired. There are some people who their children have left home. Maybe it's an opportunity, or some of them, their children are abroad or somewhere very far. Maybe it's an opportunity to start working with these groups, you know, to keep them happy and active. You know, it was in um, Cuba that they said they had a high level of um, elderly people who some of them in their hundreds, 120, and they are still living. So things like this could help our elderly um, parents, grandparents, great grandparents to be happy by keeping them active and helping them to helping them to give back to society. And at the same time, the young people can learn from there too. You'll be shocked at the things we can learn. And then here also we have our students. You know, this place is a collection of students that are, you know, engineers, philosophers, artists, and we bring them together 
to be able to show them something else, something that is of wonder. Those organisms I was showing you earlier, some of them will never ever have connection with this, but helping them to see things and then gradually in initiating some kind of responsibility in them is something that we do. You know, let our students practice. You see this one here. We, in partnership with the science organization here, the professional science organization, the British Ecological Society, the, the students here were from different parts of the UK. They are from the low income minority areas. Some of these students, A-level students or 16 to 18 year old students are leaving home for the first time. Some of them never enter the train and some of them will be the first to go into higher education should they succeed at the time. So we had brought them here to be able to give them something of ecology. I'm sure if, we, if the picture was clearer, this is a cow. So we brought them from different parts of the UK to this place so that they can have an understanding of things. Initially, no, indirectly, there is giving these children confidence. Another aspect is also giving them the fact that they can be responsible, they can be pillars of their environment for the future. This kind of connections, this kind of interventions in our students is also another way of moving things forward. You know, like in our country, sometimes the majority of the students could be on, on strike. Maybe if we start having some grants or some collaborations, it will start helping the students to feel a sense of belonging, a sense of worth, self-worth and confidence development. And of course, we can use our women, you know, some people will know that this one is the uniform for the Catholic women organization. Maybe we can this, you know, and there are different association groups. Maybe we can start um, helping our mothers to our women, uh, ladies, to start understanding other aspects of the environment that they can apply at home. Small, small things that through our engineering activities, our engineering solutions, we might start helping to bridge the gap so that even whatever we do, our communities become stronger and more viable. In summary, are we protecting our collective property? Yes, it is that we should leave no one behind, irrespective of where they are. If we're going to have protect uh, collective property, it means we have a collective responsibility. It's talking about order, we are talking about order. So what I have said today is that we have to consciously change the way we do things, change, change think about the way we do things and think about them so that we're able to maintain a balance between what we do and the output of what we do. And that we need to maintain our biodiversity, our ecosystem, it belongs to all of us. So through our work, we can actually help to keep that balance. Right? And then we need to raise awareness, engage people, and then see for researchers, some of us are researchers, some of us are practitioners, maybe we can see how we can through what we do, or maybe even our connections with other people in the community, you know, do something that will create the necessary impact. We can't change the world overnight. We can do it small by small based on the things we can do from our own innate um, skills and giftings. And then of course, we also need to use a language that is inclusive. You know, if we use a language that the illiterate, the people who are not in our technical area, people who may not even understand high-ended big big things maybe we can be more inclusive and that is part of the inclusive reducing equality inequality as um, the one of the sustainable development goals has said so it's very important you know bridging the gap between our high-ended technical knowledge and breaking it down so that the local person the illiterate can understand and that way we have a collective way a collective responsibility of helping ourselves within our environment. And finally, what I will say is that um, together we can stand and then divided we fall. So I would like to acknowledge all the people who pictures I have used and um, thank you very much to the Manchester chapter of um, the Nigerian Society of Engineers for inviting me. I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you. Yes, so thank you very much, uh, Cecilia, um, for, for the wonderful presentation. Well, I must say we ran over time a little bit, but because it was quite interesting and uh, unique, I didn't want to interrupt. So um, I had typed in to ask um, colleagues to post their, their questions. 
Um, I haven't seen many questions, to be honest. Uh, so let me see, you're welcome to, so yeah, so. Okay, so um, I can't find any questions. So um, it looks like you've done a very great job in trying to simplify things to the extent that you were able to make um, everyone, despite our diversity and differences in disciplines to understand this, which is, which is uh, incredible anyway. Um, so, um, so, well, if people were unable to type, so has anything come to anyone's mind since I posted my chat with regards to asking for questions? Has anyone thought of anything they want to ask? Cecilia, it's a new theme. And it's a very important one, so don't lose the opportunity. Okay, well, there's a hand up. Okay, there is a hand up. Um, so yes, um, this is Kunle Adebajo. Can I please ask you to unmute yourself and speak, sir? Thank you very much indeed, and uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you to our wonderful uh, speaker, because I think this was action packed, very um, comprehensive and uh, in some ways also inspiring as to what to do. Um, I do agree we are engineers, but possibly one of the problems we engineers also face is that we tend to only focus, or maybe I should say not only, but we tend to focus quite a lot on what we think is our training and leave a lot of the rest. So if I say that in this fully action-packed kit um, that you've given us, it's great, but somewhere in your talk, you just happened by the way to mention population, increasing population. And along the line, you made a comment, whether voluntary or involuntary, that oh, nothing we can do about that. And I'm quite concerned because the truth is all that you've enumerated and everything here is still seriously based on the fact that we as human beings worldwide, but certainly in Nigeria, are just increasing at an alarming rate. And so if you are continuously trying hard to do remedial measures, but the people causing the waste, causing the issues are increasing by the day, by the minute, then it's a losing battle in its own way. So I wonder why we as engineers, and of course, I know you are not an engineer, but you uh, align well with us, why we aren't making a bigger, bigger deal about the fact that we need to slow down population increase. In Nigeria, it's totally out of everybody just comes dancing when everybody has a child up to 10, you know, we're all excited. And then we now go and lament in a corner that, ah, this waste, ah, this say uh, this, uh, this one, ah, you know, but we're, we're, we're missing the elephant in the room, you know? So I, I'll stop there, but I, I mean, I think that's, it's something which we, we need to, we need to be much more vocal. I'm an engineer and I agree. People will say, are oh, you out of your depth in that line? But really, we must start talking about it too. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I think you have just hit the nail on the head. We need to talk about these issues. You know, it's true. Everybody wants to, that is part of fruitfulness to have babies. <laughs> but I think also, you have to also be realistic that some of these issues aren't discussed in church. You know, in most of our religious institutions, they don't discuss this kind of thing. And this kind of issue comes under environmental stewardship. Because even a circumstance whereby we are over abstracting our overuse, if you start analyzing that some of the people who are, you know, like who are spending a lot of money for students, um, children's school fees, even for a child in kindergarten, I don't think they want to have many children, even in our country. So I think it's time for us to start taking ownership of where we are. So belonging to organizations, belonging to establishments makes it makes us automatically responsible where we stand. So that it's not just about us going and shouting and ticking boxes that we are part. If we have something, they should come and visit us. No, <laughs> it is for us to start being a part of that system. And who knows, by virtue of what we know, we may be surprised that what we know 
is by far more than what some people don't know. Uh, thank you very much for thank your you. response, um, Cecilia. Um, I have a question here. I can see Stephen has his hand up, but just before that, I think uh, Adele posted a question here, which I would just like to quickly read out. Um, it's um, Adele wants to know if um, there are action groups working at the local communities in Nigeria towards educating our people. So do we have action groups that are, because I know part of what you proposed was um, for people to educate people, our children on, you know, the implication of, um, you know, these things. That, so do we have action groups on ground <laughs> yeah. that are advocating these points? You know what, right. uh, thank you. <laughs> It's good to ask this kind of question. It also helps to raise a flag on what we have as issues. You know, in our country, when we do things, everybody does it personal, 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 personal. You know, and then it becomes a personal consulting business and everything, and then you do it short term, and then you stop. Nobody thinks about it anymore. That I can't say there are particular ones, but I know there was one that um, Chevron was running. So even that one, when I went, I'm not so sure what they do. But what I know is that it will be good if there are already small systems in place that maybe we can actually think beyond our own self and our own name and our own grant and our own money and our own popularity to work together to see how we can do this. So in response to Mr. Adele, honestly, I don't know. I know there are some, if you Google online, because I have done it, I see there are some things and then you check, you call the number, nobody's speaking. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, may I call on Stephen Granville? Hey, good evening, sir. Good evening, our presenter. Um, thank you so much for this um, informative um, presentation. Um, it is the process that determines the product. That's what I always tell people. Um, and you talked about uh, benchmarking and having effective standards, yeah? Yeah. And uh, my question is, is that is it that the the, the research carry, that, that has been carried out in low and medium countries like Nigeria by various researchers are not effective enough, or is it that they are not able to close the gap and to help us develop to help us develop these needed standards? And does it also further reiterate that? Um, our institutions, our environmental institutions are weak. We need to tell ourselves the truth and what we need to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think, look, I'm sure, you know, we are Nigerians. We are not from somewhere else. We are who we are. If you look critically, if you go and read through majority of the papers that we have, you will see that majority of what we compare with is something that happens somewhere else. What I can say is that if we have an understanding that we have a problem, then that is where we know we have a solution. Okay. Because if we're going to develop, you know, if how can we sit in Nigeria and be comparing our results, the, our own results, with what happened in, um, in the US, in the UK, they have developed a standard based on the systems that they have, based on the resources that they have. We have not been able to do that. So, okay, you will say that maybe this is a problem with our regulators, but let's also face it, our, our university is really supported. Maybe they are supported, but do we really have a focus that this is what we need to do as a government? This is what we need to do as academics. This is what, you know, maybe there could be a synergy between what we do as academics with the people who are practitioners so that together we can, we can actually work even with local people who may not have, you know, may have an understanding of things to develop our own system. It has to be an issue that all of us will think about. But it has never been, go and read some of the things. You see that some of the things are very like expired something. And we're still using expired standards that we got from somewhere as, you know, in 2021. So because there is no standard, if you go and read through our research publications, you will see that there is no baseline. There is nothing to compare with. You know, you are in the South doing your research. How does your research compare with another Southern area within the country? Even though we know there is a disparity in those there are differences between the Northern Nigeria, the Southern, the Eastern Nigeria, the Western Nigeria. There are differences between our systems. Yes, we have no standards, but if we read something with, so it is a call for action. 
So the baseline should 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 start from Nigeria and not going abroad first. Yes, it should start from Nigeria. You can't compare. Okay, you are comparing your results. We see our water is so polluted. We have high human population. How do you compare your standard with a country that is half a state of Kano or just you know or let's say Ogu State, a country, and then you compare their results and use it as standard for comparing Nigeria. And yet they don't have a human population. The resources are, are available. The infrastructures are well maintained. How do we compare? <laughs> thank you, madam. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So um, I'm going to call on uh, Dr. Fakende, our chairman of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia. That is uh, a brilliant work. I have a lot. I have a lot of dotted down. Ah, not because too much of, that. Because of our time, yeah, yes, because okay. of our time. <laughs> <laughs> because one of them is what you have spoken about, which is uh, data. We don't have data in the country. That's the problem. I was doing a research in data at the point. I couldn't get data of even the uh, weather data in Nigeria to be able to do anything. The nearest I got is some from Ghana, you know, and maybe uh, after that, not even get any more than So I believe one of our problems is how to be able to gather data, to be able to compare our results with what is happening in the international world. That's one of the problems. And then the second one, which I want to mention briefly, is what is the aim of the town planning system? Because all the things you have mentioned now is blocking a lot of uh, openings and all other places that's supposed to be beneficiary to the ecosystem. So what are the town planning people doing concerning situations? Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Are you asking me the question, sir? <laughs> oh, well, I can answer the question. I can answer the question. You know, maybe it also opens up the need for us to, to work with other people. And why am I saying this? A few years ago, I lived in Lagos on the island. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it flooded. And the water entered our house. And the good thing was that we had, you know, it was just a bit higher up that, you know, it flooded the fridge, it flooded the whole city, everything was filled up. And um, I now decided that I have a friend who works with the ministry so that let them, let me call them so that they can bring people to block, to unblock the drain so that the water can flow. And then I told him and he came. He came to her, he said, look, Cecilia, the problem is these people here have built on floodplain. They shouldn't have been given the permission. We actually told them that they should not build on here. But you know, Cecilia, how things are, where we are, people, you know, they have connections and this, and started showing me how some walls, some fences were already being soaked with water. Look, it is good to use your powers as much as possible. But when the problems come, it is everybody's problem because what happened was that he actually showed me that some areas were beginning to collapse, but he said they were going to do something. That if I could mobilize the people, the landlords in the area so that they can bring people from the radio station to come and make some noise. And then the government at that time, the minister for and the commissioner for environment can help, you know, focus on that area. Then maybe we can start from somewhere and then sensitize people to stop building on floodplain or and on river on riverside. So I thought that was a good idea. And then I started telling the landlords, because I'm not a landlord then, I was a tenant. And we started, you know, mobilizing people. But on the day that he came with the people that needed to come, I'm telling you, nobody came out. I was the only person. And the same thing I did, they did it in VGC, and then it was spotlighted in VGC, and they made some news, and the government spent some money clearing the drains in VGC, in the, you know, on, on the island. So what are we saying? First and foremost, the people who make the decision on the planning may have done their own work. But how much support do they have? Because the issue is that some of us will be opportune to be in very high positions where we make decisions. But the issue is that how do we make a decision that is beneficial, not only for ourselves, but for the future? 
the house you have built and the water soaks in and collapses your house, of what use is that? Because you have the power, but if people, the local people, the local authority, the council start working together, then we might see how we can move ahead. And that is number one. Number, number two is just the fact that even the water companies have a stake in this because where, do, if I'm to ask any of us here, where does your pipe go to? The pipe from your toilet, from your kitchen, in your home in Nigeria, where does it go to? How many of us can actually beat our chest to say we know? <laughs> so I hope, sir, I have tried to say something. <laughs> Yes, you have. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take the last question, considering how much time we, um, how by how much we've overrun. Um, I would like to take um, ask um, Solomon Macajola to please unmute, please unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Please make it as concise as possible. Yeah, thank you very much, and um, and thank you, um, Cecilia, for the presentation. Ah, Sha, you have raised one valid point. Amongst others. <laughs> Sorry, um, um, Solomon, you, I, I don't know if it's from me, but you don't sound very audible. I don't know if others can hear you. No, we can't. Wow. You, 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 oh, okay. you, now, we can't yeah, hear. now it's better, yeah. You can hear me now, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, you made you made one valid point, which has amongst many valid points, uh, which has to do with uh, comparing our standards with what is happening, probably in the Western world. Uh, I've I've seen this happening uh, as someone is engaged in the manufacturing industry here in Nigeria, um, especially when it comes to the in implementation of some of these uh, environmental strategies like the EPR. Uh, as a government, you signed up to one international agreement, and then you come in and you want to push it down the industry here. For example, oh, you are going to ban the usage of, of plastic packaging, or, or another example is start using biodegradable materials as if and it's available everywhere. Uh, and then what, what will also, I mean, just to bring it home to us, you know, looking at the recent COVID era, uh, because the government in the in the US, in the UK, they, they said people should stay at home. Nigeria also rushed and said people stay at home. But you know, it never really was successful in Nigeria because the government, you know what the government in the UK, in Canada and US were doing to keep people at home, which they couldn't do. So the question now is this, how can we encourage solutions you know, that are suitable for developing nations like Nigeria and stop to just, and, and to stop this, trend of just relying on what is happening in the western world thank you thank you solomon i think yeah. um we are coming to a point whereby we have to appreciate who we are <laughs> let's appreciate who we are and what we're capable of doing because even in the western world they started from somewhere and why am i even saying they started from somewhere is i will use an example of a biological index there is a biological index that was developed here called the Biological Monitoring Working Party that is used as an indication by the ecologists to assess the state of pollution of water bodies. It was developed in the UK. Honestly, as I speak to you, we don't have one in Nigeria. <laughs> you know, I am aware that other countries like in Thailand, like in Myanmar, they have looked for ways whereby they could develop such a standard. What happened here is that if we are going to progress in our own country, we have to take ownership that this is ours. If we are in positions of authority, maybe small, small ways for us to start giving leeway to the researchers to do effective research. That is not just you know, publishing papers, but effective research whereby we can say, okay, this is what we are presenting at this time, and it should be sanctioned by the government, you know, should be given the go ahead by the government. The government has a role to play. It looks like the government has a role to play in even with the researchers in our country. Why am I saying this? If, for example, the pollution control department at the, in Nigeria brought out the fact that during the environmental impact assessment carried out on a particular location that development should not take place. And then all of a sudden, we now had a reversal from the government that said, no, you should keep your understanding somewhere 
and this development is going to carry on, then it means whatever research or whatever thinking you have, you have been crippled. So we may not be able to change situations. We may not be able to change Nigeria, but maybe what we could do is that where we are in our positions of authority, because I don't think that um, this Nigeria Society of Engineering and meeting and engineers Manchester chapter meeting is just meeting for the sake of meeting. I want to believe that gradually we want to start taking ownership and ownership of issues, circumstances that is not only about us, but about other people who are connected, related, associated with us and our environment. <laughs> Thank you. I hope maybe I have tried, Solomon, to answer your question. <laughs> yes, you have. And uh, I think you've um, tried. And I think uh, we need to, I need to kind of shield you from further bullets now. It's, uh, I think we've received enough. Um, it's been a very, I'm not surprised because it's been a very interesting presentation, a very relevant topic, and it's a very interesting theme as well. Um, I think on that, um, I would like to move on to the next point on the agenda, which is a vote of thanks. Now, um, under normal circumstances, this would be given by either our general secretary or their assistants and who are both females i would like to tell you again cecilia but they're unable to attend today so um i will again be um filling in the shoes of um our general secretary uh to give the vote of thanks so um i would like to thank you very much for this um very very insightful and um important presentation um i would like to also um, I would like to emphasize the fact that um, the, the, the preparation time was also very short. So I know I gave you not too much of, um, of notice as compared to what we usually have. And we're very appreciative of the fact that you were able to, to pull it off. I know it would have taken a lot of resources and time to, to do this within the, the short time. So thank you very much. Um, we've taken quite um, a lot of the points you've um, stipulated on board would we'll see um, how we can help action some of these. And if there's any requirement for us to come back to you to seek further guidance on the implementation of some of these, well, um, I hope you'll be um, open to, to such ideas. We have some close um, relationship with the Nigerian Institute of Environmental Engineers. Um, I hope that is, I've, I'm right, I'm calling the name correctly. And so some of these ideas are things we can actually pass on. And if um, there are quick wins that can be easily implemented and um, we can always um, um, collaborate with you or link you up with them as, as, as the situation may be. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for, for coming on board. Um, we look forward to more collaborations such as this one in the future. And uh, on that note, we've officially finished the technical session bit and uh, we'll be immediately transiting to the, um, to the general meeting. So um, please, for those that came with the intention of attending the technical session alone, um, you're free to to drop off, we'll now, members will now be moving on to the general meeting where we'll be reviewing our minutes of last meeting and talking about some strategic issues. So thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Evening. Uh, evening. Yes, I'm Engineer Aisha by name. First awesome. and foremost.